Okay. Are you ready? You want to take a yes. sip of water? No, I'm good. I'm I'll good. I'll take a sip of water. Okay. Welcome to EMTV. As a journalist or as a photographer, how do you capture an event or a topic that deeply affects you personally? Well, Alisa is such a photographer. She's from Ukraine, she works for us, for EM, and she went to some demonstrations against the war in her home country. And that's what we're going to be talking about. And later there will be a video on, well, the other topic that will be dominating the Dutch media this week, the local elections. In Kralingen wonen nu ontzettend veel studenten, meer dan 5000. Rotterdam is een van de jongste steden van Nederland, een hele jonge bevolking. Eén op de acht Rotterdammers is student, maar er zit geen enkele student in de Rotterdamse gemeenteraad. Uh, dus ik vind het belangrijk dat wij er ook gewoon zijn en ook mogen meedoen in de besluitvorming. Alisa, let's start. How are you doing? Well, better, but uh, still the emotions sometimes take a roof on me. Is it something you can believe that's no. really happening already? No. I can't. No. The closest that I came to believing mm -hmm. was uh, when my aunt arrived to the Netherlands this weekend. And uh, the moment I saw her, she just started to talk about how my sister is back in Ukraine, how everything is back in Ukraine, the way she, she crossed four countries to come here. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the moment when I actually was the closest to realizing, but I cannot say that I realize what is going on. Can you, can you perhaps take me back to uh, February 24th, that's the day the war started. I think you probably woke up with the news that your country was in war, um, that your country where your st family still lives, and a few hours later you were already demonstrating in The Hague against the war and you took your camera with you. Of course. <laughs> yeah. um, the thing is, it was very funny, but um, the day, the evening before, mm -hmm. I was chatting with my uh, cousin that is in the US and uh, he said, I'm so nervous, I don't know, but I feel like this night something is gonna, is gonna start. And I just said, well, the rumors said that it was gonna be starting on the 16th of February, then mm -hmm. it was on the 20th, like, I don't believe this anymore, I just hope it's not gonna start. The next morning I wake up and uh, my partner tells me, well, they started bombing Ukraine. And first things I thought, I was like, this is not, what? Like, is it a joke? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to, what, prank me or something? Mm -hmm. Then um, the next thing I thought, okay, maybe they started bombing Donbass. So the territories that are now Ukrainian, mm -hmm. um, they maybe started to bomb Kramatorsk or Mariupol, the closest cities to Donetsk. And the thing is, <laughs> we didn't have internet at home. My phone died, so I couldn't check the oh, news. Oh, really? So I, while I was charging mm -hmm. and everything, I was stressing, I was panicking. Then the first news that I saw that they started bombing Chernihiv, which is very far from Donetsk. And I realized that something is really bad happening. The next things I saw, all the chats from my Ukrainian mm -hmm. friends here, like, are you going to The Hague? Are you going to The Hague? We are on the, we are on the way, we're already mm -hmm. in The Hague, come. Because that was the only thing you could do. Yeah, that's the only thing that you can think about when you wake up to the situation when your home is mm -hmm. being destroyed. So I didn't take lunch, I didn't do anything, we just, we just went on the way. I was started calling my parents, my family and my friends. And uh, on that day, everything was fine. They were safe uh, as much as it was should, possible. Yeah. Um, so we arrived to the Russian embassy first. And I was there with my camera because uh, I knew that I could just stand there, but there's also something else I could do. Mm -hmm. And there's also something else as a part of the EM that I can do and bring this story to campus because this is very important to talk about it. We have a lot, a lot of students from Ukraine and from Russia. And, and from, from Russia and one yes. say, yeah. And from other Russian speaking countries mm -hmm. as well. And um, yeah, this is the problem that is not only we face. And uh, I realize that it's my responsibility as a Ukrainian, mm -hmm. as a photographer and as a part of the EM to do it, because uh, if not me, then, then who? And what do you think is the difference between your pictures and perhaps from a photographer who grew up here in the Netherlands? Well, I was thinking about it and uh, I guess the biggest difference is that I know on the personal level mm -hmm. what is going on. I know what the people are shouting because I understand the language, mm. because I, 
I like to say that I'm a generation of Maidan mm -hmm. because when the Maidan happened, I was um, the first Maidan happened. I was three years old. My parents also went there, and uh, then the other revolution, the Euro Maidan, as people might heard it, uh, happened when I was twelve in 2014. You grew up with all these protests. Yes, basically. I grew up yeah. on Maidan. Let's mm -hmm. say my parents were there almost every day. Me and my sister, we were not allowed to leave the house because it was very dangerous because of the, all the provocations. Mm -hmm. And there is also a very nice movie about it. It's called The Winter on Fire. It's on Netflix. So that's, Watch it. Yes. It's a good documentary mm -hmm. to, to know the history mm -hmm. of what is going on. So that's also uh, played a big role because um, as a Ukrainian, when you know there is something going on that mm -hmm. you don't want, what you do is you go out there and talk about it. Yeah. You're not going to stay home silent. You're not going to be scared. That's not what we have in our DNA. That's also what you didn't do. You went to The Hague to protest, to know, to do what you did. But you also captured it. Do you think you captured different things than other photographers? Yes, maybe in some sense, because um, there are some symbols that not all of the people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, there was a person with a Crimea flag and uh, he also looked quite Tatarian, <laughs> let's say. Um, and he had also uh, different symbols and uh, posters. And most of the posters that I saw, they were either in Ukrainian or in Russian, also in English, but Ukrainian mostly. And the language is very, um, let's say on the emotional level, mm -hmm. some words could be a bit more strong than the other words. Yes. And if you don't speak the language, then of course you would not know the difference and you no. would not know why is this poster more important than the other one. Fair, yeah. So I think uh, that picture that is on my feed, the one that I think is very, very uh, strong, mm -hmm. is with the girl that says, um, go away from my home. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the rain, there was a four hour rain during that day while we were standing. Um, the, the the color went mm -hmm. away a bit, so it was really like emotional in some sense. Also, she was wearing a babushka. This is like a, like a scarf. Mm -hmm. And that's also like very uh, connecting to what the home is. Because that was for you, the scarf or the on scarf. its own was already a reminder of your home. Yes, because it was a traditional Ukrainian, mm -hmm. uh, not just a regular scarf. No. So it was a and the way she was looking was mm -hmm. also very Ukrainian, let's say. <laughs> so for me, it was uh, this. This, was, this is this, the symbol. This yeah. is the symbol. For me, she is the symbol. Yeah. Dressed as someone for my home. And then with a sign, please leave my home. My home. Yeah. And how was it? Because it, that was a demonstration in The Hague. A few days after we had a demonstration here in Rotterdam. Did that feel different for you? Because you went there as well as a photographer? Yeah. Uh, that was a bit different because uh, here in Rotterdam, there was mostly students. Mm -hmm. I think we were around 400 people and they were not only Ukrainians. No. I met almost everyone from my program, mm -hmm. international students, and I was actually pretty yeah. well surprised in mm -hmm. a good sense that they all came and there were people from Brazil, from everywhere, uh, Argentina, <laughs> from US, from Iran mm -hmm. even. And um, I was very glad that they came to support. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's also, there was also a lot of Ukrainians and Russians. I think here it was more to show that uh, Rotterdam stands mm -hmm. with Ukraine and that students of Erasmus stand with Ukraine and that we are here and we need the attention of media mm -hmm. and of the government. Well, and you are part of media because you took the pictures. Yeah. Did it feel weird or did it feel... It felt like the only thing that I could do. Mm -hmm. Like there was no other option. Mm -hmm. I knew that I'm not going to stay at home and that I'm not going to go somewhere else or do somewhere else. There was only like there was the spot that I had to be. Mm. There was just no other option. And you did do something else, actually. I can see it on your sweater because you started the discussion also here right away on how to ride Kiev. Because yeah. we wrote it in English different than well, the, 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 what you can see on your sweater. Um, can you tell me perhaps why this is an important yeah. thing to remember. That is important, mm -hmm. of course, because uh, that's the framing of language mm -hmm. and how, in general, language can uh, represent our reality. And the sa at the same time, it constructs our reality. 
So when you say Kiev or if you write it Kiev with I E V, mm -hmm. then um, it's more uh, towards Russian mm -hmm. language because it's a transliteration from Russian language. Yeah. But it's a Ukrainian capital. So in Ukrainian language, it sounds like Kyiv. So it's more strong, <laughs> know, not so soft. Um, and you write it like here mm -hmm. with a Y I V. Um, why it's important? Because um, the same thing with the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. When you say the Ukraine, you consider the country to be a part of something. So it used to be the Ukraine when it was a part of the, the USSR. Yeah, a while, while ago. Yeah, but for now it's mm -hmm. Ukraine because it's a country that's independent country. Yes. We don't have an uh, article mm -hmm. before it anymore. So yeah. So it's part of using it correctly, saying was this version of Kiev, and not, uh, and but also putting in uh, putting in it in the right historical context. Yes, exactly. And yeah, the same with my surname, let's say, because it's uh, in Russian mm -hmm. it sounds like Magaletska ya. Mm -hmm. In Ukrainian it's Mahaletska, but so in slightly English different, yes. yes, in English it's Mahaletska, because of the transliteration. Mm. The G in Russian, H in Ukrainian, and in English it's H. And what do you use now if you introduce yourself to people? Well, if it's English, if it's an English-speaking person, then I say I'm Mahaletska. But why not in, in Ukraine? Because that's, that's your country and your name. Yeah, but uh, if I say Mahaletska, that's a bit weird, like a person cannot really write it then. Perhaps we should learn how to. <laughs> that would be nice, that would be nice. Yeah. And um, how is your family? My family is hopefully safe. Um, my parents, uh, because the, the the bank that my dad works mm -hmm. for, they already evacuated everyone from Ukraine, so they're safe outside. But uh, all the other family of mine is still in Ukraine. Um, I talked to my granddad mm -hmm. this morning for the first time during this whole thing. Oh, because really? Yes. We didn't have any mm -hmm. connection, any contact. He is uh, in Kyiv Oblast and uh, he said that uh, he wants to go to Poland. He's already 85, so he can leave the country. Yes, he doesn't have to fight in the war. Yeah, um, but also he's 65, yes. 85. Um, and it means that he has to be, he has to go to the train, take the train to Poland, mm -hmm. which now, I don't know, it can take uh, up to 10 hours. Ooh, that's a long journey. Yeah, and he has to be there alone because uh, no one else is left in Kyiv. So I don't know how that's going to go. Oh. I really don't know. I really, really hope. Because he, he's going to Poland. Is he also coming here to your aunt? Uh, no, I think he's going to stay in Polish, Poland. He actually, his dad, so my granddad, mm -hmm. is Polish. Ah. So I th I'm pretty sure he speaks the language. Maybe not that well because he's already very old. He hasn't been there for quite mm -hmm. a long time. But uh, I know, I think he, he can manage no, <laughs> staying well. in Poland. I really want to thank you for being here today. Also, thank you for capturing and making those beautiful pictures. I think we will be seeing a lot more from you in the next few months at the end. Thank you right. for joining us. And thank you all for watching. Uh, we will be back in two weeks with another AM TV. Um, and uh, are you going to vote during the local elections or are you allowed to vote? Then perhaps you want to vote for these Rotterdam students because they're up for the vote. Op 16 maart zijn de verkiezingen voor de gemeente- en wijkraadsverkiezingen in Nederland en dus ook in Rotterdam. Een paar studenten van de Erasmus Universiteit hebben zich kandidaat gesteld. We praten met een paar van hen om te weten waarom ze zich nu al tijdens hun studie willen inzetten in de politiek en wat ze voor andere studenten willen betekenen. Hi, ik ben Mina Morkoc. Ik ben 24 jaar en ik studeer rechtsgeleerdheid en fiscaal recht. En ik ben de nummer 5 op de lijst van GroenLinks voor de gemeenteraadsverkiezingen. Hi, ik ben Jasper Klaassen, 25 jaar. Ik studeer geneeskunde en rechten en ik sta voor D66 Rotterdam op de lijst voor de gemeenteraadsverkiezingen op plek 18. Ik ben Friso, 20 jaar en ik studeer econometrie. En voor de VVD wil ik de wijkraad in van Kralingen. Jasper, je bent nu nog student, maar je bent ook uh, um, kandidaat voor de gemeenteraad. Waarom wil je nu al de gemeenteraad in? Ja. Rotterdam is een van de jongste steden van Nederland, een hele jonge bevolking. Een op de acht Rotterdammers is student, maar er zit geen enkele student in de Rotterdamse gemeenteraad. Met een gemiddelde leeftijd van 45 zie je gewoon dat er niemand is om de belangen van ons te behartigen. De wijkraad is wel echt ontzettend leuk, want bij de wijkraad gaat het helemaal over Kralingen. Dus het gaat over alles wat met Kralingen te maken heeft. Van studentenkamers tot stoeptegels en plantenbakken. 
En als student wil ik de studenten vertegenwoordigen. Ik wil kamers gaan bijbouwen en daarnaast wil ik Gradingen ook een heel stuk groener maken. Ik vind het belangrijk dat studenten worden gerepresenteerd in de gemeenteraad. Dat is nu niet zo. En als student dan weet je natuurlijk wat er gebeurt in de stad. Beter dan de meeste andere mensen. Uh, dus ik vind het belangrijk dat wij er ook gewoon zijn en ook mogen meedoen in de besluitvorming. Waarom zouden wij op jou moeten stemmen? Ja, in Kralingen wonen nu ontzettend veel studenten, meer dan 5000. Maar op dit moment zit in de oude wijkraad geen enkele student. En dat wil ik veranderen. Um, daarom heb ik me ook als studentkandidaat gesteld. En ik ben ook een van de weinige studenten die überhaupt op de lijst staat. Ik ben een geboren en getogen Rotterdammer. Dus ik weet hoe mooi de stad is. Maar ik weet ook echt wel waar er dingen zijn die kunnen worden verbeterd. En ik wil graag dat dit een, een groene stad wordt. En daar wil ik me graag voor inzetten. Ja, heel veel mensen die kijken vooral naar de landelijke politiek of om te kijken waarop ze gaan stemmen voor de gemeenteraadsverkiezingen. Maar juist in de gemeente zijn er hele lokale problemen die voor studenten heel belangrijk zijn. Er is in Kraling heel veel te doen over het studentenoverlast. Um, er is een stoplichtsysteem geïntroduceerd waarin studenten hun huis uit kunnen worden gegooid. En dat zijn hele belangrijke thema's die heel direct gevolgen hebben voor de leefsituatie van studenten. Um, als je zo gekozen wordt in de gemeenteraad, hoe ga je dat combineren met je studie? Ik heb altijd dingen gedaan naast mijn studie. Ik ben er graag een bezig bij. Dus ik uh, zie dit ook als een mooie kans om de studenten te vertegenwoordigen in de raad. Gelukkig is de wijkraad niet zoveel werk als de gemeenteraad. De gemeenteraad is echt 30, 40 uur per week. Dat valt bij de wijkraad gelukkig mee. Meestal is het zo 10, 15 uur per week. Dus dat is op zich nog wel met econometrie te combineren. Ik moet nog een paar mastervakken en een scriptie schrijven. En dat wordt dan waarschijnlijk een beetje in de late uurtjes en in het weekend een beetje. Maar het moet goed komen.